Well, I'm going to start, and uh, I'm going to come back to the to the podium because Dave and I are going to just do a, a few minutes of overview uh, of our book. Before I do that, though, I want to thank Jana for stepping in. Uh, it's uh, impressive that uh, with just a couple hours' notice, uh, you can do so, and uh, we we suggested her because we know that she has read the book <laughs> and and reviewed it. Positively, so that was those were the two criteria we had. Um, Actually, it's just really the second. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I want to do is is uh, is start a, with a brief overview of our book, and then I'll pass the baton to to David uh, to to get into a couple of specifics. We wanted to do so just to introduce a little bit about the book before we got talking too much about it, acknowledging that uh, most people in the room probably haven't read it yet. So. Hopefully this will whet your appetite and you'll run out and buy um, copies for everyone for the holidays or something. All right. Uh, so just to give you a brief overview, uh, the book is divided into three sections. We, we uh, begin uh, by talking about Mormons as an ethno-religious group and placing Mormons within a broader religion uh, and religion and politics literature. Uh, so we do a, a little bit of, of uh, history and so on, but mostly we want to we want to uh, give an overview of why uh, we think Mormons are not exactly an ethnicity, but are, are a quasi ethnic group, right? And we'll I'll talk about that more in a moment. And then part two of the book uh, is all about the political behavior of Mormons, uh, and so we we go over uh, scintillating questions about why uh, so many Mormons are uh, Republicans. And uh, uh, which uh, I think actually is kind of interesting uh, once you dig into the data. And then we get into a little bit of, of uh, additional work on uh, particular issues and how Mormons are uh, conservative but different, uh, when, especially when you contrast them to other uh, conservative religious traditions like evangelicals. And then uh, part three of the book, we talk about the consequences of this distinctiveness in terms of how Mormons are perceived. Um, and then a, a conclusion that, that uh, looks at uh, some of the bigger questions related to that. So let me just talk for a minute about uh, what we see as the, the theoretical foundation of the book. And this is uh, the idea that, uh, that we treat Mormons as an ethno-religious group. And so we, we, uh, we define Mormons within this broader literature about ethnicity uh, acknowledging that that ethnicity can mean a lot of things in, in, in the literature, but but and that Mormons fit that definition in some ways, but not others. Um, but especially, they fit in terms of this distinctive religious subculture, in terms of the uniqueness that Mormons have, in terms of their belief system compared to other Christians, and the extraordinary levels of. Uh, religiosity that you find among uh, active identifying Mormons. Um, and so we, we, we go through that distinctiveness in uh, a lot of detail uh, with some unique data that we collected, uh, a national survey of American Mormons, uh, and then using comparative data that we, uh, that we get from uh, Pew and other sources. Uh, and then another, uh, one thing we point out as we, as we get into this, uh, is that as you think about uh, the homogeneity that many people presume of active Mormons, and in fact, that's not exactly correct, that there's a lot of uh, variation within uh, this Mormon subculture. And we, def we divide that uh, into four different uh, categories, and, and we develop measures uh, for these things in terms of how to distinguish between people that exhibit high and, and lower levels of, of religious activity. Uh, uh, we, we labeled this, uh, this next one uh, authority. It's a, we create an index in, in, in every case in terms of uh, our, respond, our survey respondents' levels of religiosity and activity, uh, their levels of deference and obedience to authority. And we do that both in terms of, of uh, questions of doctrine, theology, and also just general attitudes about obedience. Um, and then we think about it in terms of insularity, uh, and we use some measures related to uh, how many of your close friends and family members are members of the church. And then we talk uh, about it in terms of social identity. 
uh, drawing from uh, uh, concepts in political psychology and psychology in general about group identity and, and the strength of, of that identity and affinity with the church. And those measures get used throughout the book. So we, we, uh, we lay them out in some detail early on so that uh, they're well understood as we use them later in the book to, uh, to examine a lot of questions, especially about Mormon political attitudes and behavior. And they, and they become quite useful and, and helpful to understand that. Uh, the other thing I, I should explain, because I think this is maybe the concept that is uh, the most helpful related to the theme of the, of the conference uh, on, on boundaries, is a concept that we develop in the book uh, that we call the sacred tabernacle. And this stems from um, some sociology work by a sociologist named Peter Berger, who talks about uh, what he calls the sacred canopy, which is a, um, a concept mostly in reference to, to religion in Europe uh, and, and thinking about uh, uh, how widely shared religious beliefs provide a common sense of, of meaning across society. And, and, um, but we take it and contrast it with uh, something that Christian Smith, a sociologist at, at, the, at the University of Notre Dame, developed to talk about evangelicals, which he, he develops a term called the, uh, the sacred umbrella, uh, where for evangelicals who are trying to get along in a broader, more secular society, they use their religious beliefs like an umbrella to sort of shield them uh, as individuals from uh, the, the vicissitudes of the larger uh, secular society. For Mormons, it's neither a canopy nor is it an umbrella. It's somewhere in between, where there's elements of individualism, of individual belief and practice that are important, but also there's a really important sense of community. Uh, and, and so we chose to call it the, sap the, the sacred tabernacle in terms of, uh, uh, of trying to, to stretch uh, the description between those two and find a balance between this individualistic uh, version that evangelicals seem to have and this uh, more dominant societal view that uh, Berger spoke of in, in terms of, of Europe uh, years ago. And so you, you can think about this in terms of this, uh, the shared sense of peoplehood and community that Mormons have, and also the idea that a tabernacle, as, as described in the Old Testament, is portable, right, and exists wherever Mormons happen to be. So if you think about um, a sort of classic case that, that many Mormons would recognize is uh, as you move into a community, uh, literally as you move in, often you call uh, a bishop or an elders quorum president or something, and you, will, you can get help to unload the truck. I mean, there's, a, there's an immediate sense of community as people sort of come and, and, and feel an obligation to, to help you unload and feel welcome, right? And, and that people can feel at home uh, within that community very quickly. Uh, so, um, okay. In terms of political behavior, um, there's you know, dozens of, of charts and tables that I won't uh, spend time on, but, but in terms of the uh, distinctiveness of Mormons, one of the things that leads to over time is the idea that Mormons are predominantly Republican. Uh, that part's not so surprising. That part everyone knows. What is a little bit surprising as we got into the data is the idea that that, that uh, transition from uh, a, a more even split that was true maybe 50 or 60 years ago uh, has continued to progress even through the most recent uh, data that we have in 2012, that, that Mormons have become increasingly Republican through the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and that progression hasn't yet peaked, if you can believe it. Uh, so uh, it, it's got to peak at some point because you know, we're going to reach 100% soon. Uh, but it's but we're not there yet. But but the but the slope of that progression is still going up with every election, right? Uh, the other the other thing we find uh, is that as you look at issues like um, traditional sort of conservative issues like abortion or immigration, Mormons have conservative views. They have conservative ideology, but it's conservative with a twist, and it's a conservative to, a conservatism that is a little more accommodating, uh, and that's in direct response to actual church positions that are uh, 
uh, a little more accommodating. I think the best example th to make that case is, is movement on the issue of immigration, where the church has taken a pretty uh, moderate stance, uh, and more recently in terms of refugees and so on. Uh, uh, Mormons tend to follow suit, right? And, and this leads into a, a, ch a final chapter in that section where we, where we take head on the question of whether or not Mormons follow their church leaders on uh, political questions. And we find that, in fact, uh, that's true, that that, in fact, uh, is the case. Now, you might say, again, well, that's not so surprising. We already knew that. And I guess I would, I would push back and say, uh, we thought we knew that, and the, the tools of modern social science have developed to a point where we can do uh, randomized controlled experiments in a survey setting and isolate whether or not um, a position that the church takes as presented in a survey question can actually move attitudes. And in fact, it does. You can isolate that cause and effect in a survey setting. What we find is that uh, under the, the right conditions, and I won't go into all of them here, but we can do a little bit of that if we want in the, in the discussion, but we find especially that specificity matters, that, that when the church is uh, vague about a, a particular issue, that, that sometimes the membership uh, who would like to do what their leaders say doesn't quite get the message. Um, and my favorite example here is actually uh, the uh, uh, historical example uh, that, that some of you will, will remember, and that's the MX missile uh, statements made by uh, uh, President uh, Spencer W. Kimball in, in the 80s. The, the U.S. government announces that they're going to build this missile system in the West, in Utah, and Nevada, in the desert. It's a track system where they're going to move missiles around and try to keep them uh, from the Soviet uh, satellites and hide them in, in bunkers around. And, and it's a costly and expensive uh, construction project that's going to bring a lot of money to the state of Utah. And Utah's political leaders get behind this, and it seems to be moving ahead. And in fact, if you look at the public opinion data, uh, Mormons in Utah are at first wary of this, but as their political leaders get behind it, they move and, be, and become more favorable toward the MX missile. Well, President Kimball has uh, a history of, of uh, uh, especially we know now, of being against war, being a very uh, peace-loving person. And, and at his instigation, I think, uh, the first presidency issued a Christmas message, of all things, that was um, a little vague because it only addressed the dangers of nuclear holocaust. As you can imagine, the, the, the first presidency Christmas message in, I think it was December 1980, had this language about the danger of nuclear war and, and, and how abhorrent that was. Well, that wasn't specific enough. And I don't think attitudes moved enough. So by, time, by the time Easter came around in the spring of 81, there was an Easter message. And the Easter message, again, decried nuclear armaments and nuclear war, right? And again, I don't think it was specific enough. Well, a couple of months later, I think it was in May, actually, if I remember right, the church actually, and, and President Kimball in particular, came out with a, a very lengthy statement opposing the MX missile. And there's not a lot of uh, contemporary public opinion data to demonstrate this with absolute certainty, but... You can see in the data, there's a very clear shift in, in public opinion uh, among Mormons in Utah. Okay, so why does this work? Uh, whether it's in the experiments that we do in the, in the book or in these historical examples, it works. One, because it's relatively, uh, relatively rare. Uh, the church uh, takes positions on political issues, on moral issues and others, uh, not every week, not every month, but, but uh, with some infrequency uh, relative to what they could do. And uh, we find that uh, when we test this in the survey in particular, that we have, to, we have to focus on issues where the church is moving members away from where they naturally are to begin with, so to the left politically. So if, if most Mormons, and most Mormons are moderate to, to uh, strong conservatives, they already share a pretty conservative view on things like uh, traditional marriage or abortion. And so doing experiments to demonstrate that the church can move them with those issues doesn't work very well because they've already sort of gotten the message. Uh, 
But we use in the book uh, an anti-discrimination statement about uh, anti-discrimination laws and some other things to show that it can be moved to the left. And I'll pass the, at this point, pass the baton to David. Um, so Quinn has talked a little bit about the internal workings of Mormonism and um, how political attitudes are structured within the Mormon community. But I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of Mormon distinctiveness, both within Mormonism, but also for how Mormons are perceived in the rest of the country, which is where we'll introduce uh, the name of Mitt Romney, although I assure you this section of the book is not only about Mitt Romney. Um, so we talk about public attitudes toward Mormons, including both positive and negative stereotypes. So for Mormons in the audience, I suspect there might be a few here today. Uh, the good news is that there are a number of positive terms that people associate with Mormonism, uh, like families and family values and being trustworthy and these sorts of things. Um, the bad news, however, is that there's also a lot of negative stereotypes, and the negative stereotypes actually outbalance the positive ones by a little bit. I don't want to overstate that because it's not as though uh, your average American is thinking only in negative terms about Mormons. Clearly, they have a mix of these things swirling around in their heads. Um, we talk a little bit about the effects of Mormon, what we call insularity, on attitudes about Mormons. And what we mean by that is um, of all religious groups in America, the one group that is the most likely to have friends and family who are of the same faith are Mormons. Um, in the jargon of social science, Mormons are more likely to bond with one another than to build bridges with those of other faiths, and that has real consequences for how they are perceived, because religions that bridge generally are religions that um, are perceived more favorably among the general public, and that's because it means that your average American is more likely to have a friend or a family member of that faith. And so well, we can contrast Mormons and Jews. There are about as many Mormons as Jews um, in the United States of America. I suspect many people in this room are not surprised to hear that, but I assure you that around the rest of the country that often comes as a shock. Um, Jews are a small group, and they are viewed very favorably by the U.S. population. Uh, Mormons are a small group and not viewed so favorably. Why is that? Well, there are, of course, a number of reasons, but one in particular is that uh, Jews bridge and Mormons bond. And I can talk more about what I mean by that, but it's, I think, important to keep that in mind as a, as a feature of um, Mormon culture. Uh, we talk a little bit about how um, the perceptions of Mormons affected Mitt Romney in 2008 and 2012, and what we demonstrate is that the political context mat matters a lot. So uh, in 2008, there's no question that Mitt Romney's Mormonism hurt him in the Republican primaries. In 2012, it's not clear at all that Romney's Mormonism um, hurt him either in the primary or in the general election um, and then, as Quinn noted, we, we end by talking a little bit about Mormon, Mormonism's role within the religious landscape of America. I just wanted to take a, a few moments, however, and share with you just a little bit of data, because I find that uh, many LDS audiences are intrigued by what I'm about to show you. So what you're looking at here on the screen is um, scores on what we call a feeling thermometer which I know sounds like a very hokey thing. It sounds like something you might do in therapy. Let's all get together and consult our feeling thermometers. Um, but what this really means is if a pollster were to call you up and ask you a question, how do you rate various religious groups or various political candidates or various brands of toothpaste on a scale of zero to 100, where zero means you're very cold and 100 means you're very warm, we would call that a feeling thermometer. And that's exactly what we've done here with religious groups. So we've asked people, how do you perceive members of these different groups on that 0 to 100 scale? And I should note, and this is important, that these uh, results only refer to um, those who are not members of that group. So this is how Catholics, how non-Catholics view Catholics. It's how non-Jews view Jews. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so you can see that um, Mormons are down here. They do beat out the atheists. Um, I have not put uh, Muslims on this list. Muslims are also um, lower than Mormons. So if you're a Mormon and you're looking at this and you're worried about the public perception of Mormons, you should be saying to yourself, thank goodness for the Muslims and the atheists, because uh, at least they score lower. Um, so that's one consequence of 
that bonding that I described. But there's another consequence, which is how Mormons view themselves. And this is part of our evidence for why Mormons should be thought of as a quasi-ethnic group, because ethnic groups have a tendency to view members of their own group very favorably. So African Americans generally give other African Americans a high score, and Latinos do the same for fellow Latinos, and Mormons do the same for Mormons. In fact, no other group on our survey in the United States likes themselves as much as Mormons do. <laughs> I'll just let that sink in for a moment. Um, so that's kind of a whimsical thing to know. But more importantly, what it demonstrates is, again, this quasi-ethnic um, nature of Mormonism. And it says something about the way Mormons are, again, perceived outside of the Mormon community. Um, so let me just close with um, a question that is, I think, often posed about the Romney campaign. So I mentioned that Mormonism definitely affected Romney in 2008 less so in 2012, but we can kind of flip that around and ask, okay, so that's how Mormonism affected Mitt, but did Mitt affect Mormonism or perceptions of Mormonism? What you're looking at is that same feeling thermometer score for Mormons going back to 2006 all the way up to January 2014, and what you can see is that line is pretty well flat. I would not make anything of that little dip down in 2012. Um, that is mere statistical noise. So you might say, doesn't look like the Romney campaign had any effect on Mormonism, nor did a certain Broadway musical, nor did Sister Wives, nor did whatever else might have been going on within Mormonism. But the story's a little more complicated than that because when you break out those scores by political persuasion, we see actually quite an interesting difference. So back in 2006, it didn't matter whether you were a Republican, an Independent, or a Democrat, all of those groups disliked Mormons equally. But by the time we get to um, 2012, you can see that those lines begin to separate. Republicans are becoming warmer toward Mormons, Democrats becoming less so, and Independents holding steady in the middle. And that continues even after the election which suggests that attitudes and perceptions toward Mormons are yet one more example of the consequences of political polarization in the United States. I will just close, I promise this will be the last thing we'll say about the book, by noting that um, this book has a whole bunch of data in it, and we have this big fancy theory about the sacred tabernacle and how Mormons have drawn boundaries both with other religions and with secular society. But what the whole thing really boils down to is a question about religious pluralism and what it means to be a religiously pluralist society. And I would suspect that what we, or I would argue that what we see among Mormons is actually in microcosm the, the American story of religion. That Mormonism is constantly trying to negotiate how it fits within a society that on the one hand is filled with lots of people of other faiths and increasingly people of no faith. And it's why I would suggest that Mormonism is sort of a leading indicator, a bellwether of where we might see religious pluralism headed in the future. So I will end there, and Jana, hand it back to you if you want to. Thank you, Dave and Quinn, very much. Uh, Dave just stole my thunder a little bit with his last comment, which leads perfectly into my first question. You, you say in the book here about that, that question of dual boundaries, and since this is a conference about boundary maintenance and the art of boundary maintenance, this seems very appropriate. You write, Mormons have clearly flourished by sharply drawing two boundaries, one with secular society or the world, and the other with other religions. Or phrased differently, Mormons are fighting a two-front war. Um, the meaning is purely allegorical, you say, about war, but the imagery is telling. In adopting such militaristic rhetoric, Mormons reinforce their self-identity as a besieged minority. Could you explain that? How are Mormons negotiating this two-front war? Well, to be honest with you, I think we've seen a little bit of this um, already in this conference and some of the questions that have been posed um, after various presentations. 
that I think for many Mormons, there is a sense that it's us against the world. Um, and that language is often used. You can find general authorities who have used that language in various talks. Boyd K. Packer was very fond of using martial imagery to um, reinforce the idea that Mormons are not just a minority, but are a minority that is highly distinctive from the rest of society and that they need to be on their guard to make sure that they have their, their battlements up and at the ready. What we mean by it is really more of a sociological concept, the idea that um, many religious groups, and particularly small religious groups, and I might go so far as to say those that have a maybe a high level of, of internal vitality, they often draw themselves in distinction to those around them. That is, they give their members a strong sense of identity. So if you are, I live in an area where there are a lot of Amish in Indiana. If you're Amish, you know what it means to be Amish. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you know what it means to be an Orthodox Jew. Those are maybe two extreme examples of groups that have a very sharp sense of identity. I would say that's true of many evangelical Christians. It's probably less true of most mainline Protestants. It's not necessarily clear, I think, to most Methodists of what it is that makes you a Methodist. But for Mormons, it is very clear. And it's clear both as they draw that distinction with secular society and again, with other religions. So it's defined by what they eat and don't eat, the clothing that they wear, the practices that they engage in, in sun on, on Sundays and through the rest of the week. And there are all these things that are bundled up that just kind of reinforce that, that distinctiveness. Sociologists refer to this as being a strict church, right? Uh, uh, that's, the, that's the language they use. And Mormons, I think, are a quintessential strict church. And it's a bit of, of a paradox if you... If you stop to think about it, you would think that churches would tend to thrive when they, when they don't require a lot of their members. But in fact, that's not what you see in the sociology of religion literature. What you see instead is that when, when, they don't, when there aren't barriers to entry, to use an economics term, when you, when you don't have to do and believe certain things to be a, a sort of an orthodox member uh, of the group, then the membership uh, within that community means less. And, and so what, what I think Mormons do well, right, is, is uh, and, and, and a positive aspect of, of this sort of boundary maintenance idea is that the, the, the rules that one has to obey to be a, an active practicing Mormon and belong to the community can be constraining in many ways, but also allow you to, the rich rewards of being a part of a community of, of people that have common beliefs and practices with your own. So there's a push and a pull there. Uh, and I think uh, part of what you see in the larger uh, religious landscape in the United States is some reactions, and I think Dave could even speak more to this, uh, reactions to, in the case of some denominations, and even perhaps Mormonism, uh, Taking that strictness and 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 introducing a a, a little a bit of uh, politics into it, politicization, and that uh, that may mean that it's it's reached beyond that sort of equilibrium where the community is and the and the boundaries maintain a a, a strong sense of community, and you and by uh, by going too strong and getting too politicized, you may you may actually alienate some people and push some people out, and that's the that's the the push and pull, right? If you loosen it too much, then it doesn't mean the, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's not the same community. Uh, it doesn't have the same value to people that belong to it. But if you if you if you pull in too much, then it can also serve to alienate, and that's that's the interesting part to study. Okay, here here's one of the surprising things about this book. You hear all the time this distinction made between Utah Mormon and non-Utah Mormon, and people say Utah Mormons, you know, no offense, present company accepted, I'm sure those, oh, those people are crazy, right? Or, you know, they are um, far more conservative, but actually you find that's not the case with maybe just a couple of exceptions. Could you talk about that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about that because it's actually the one piece of the book that in hindsight I'd wish we'd given more space to because what we find is that for the three or four pages that we talk about it, it no one believes us uh, because it, it doesn't seem to be consistent with whatever 
you know everyone's lived experiences and 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 but but there it is we we pushed and pulled this data you know up and down and and looked at it every which way and and we looked at it two ways we looked at it and uh the way we did the sampling for the survey is we is we made sure we had a representative sample from counties in the United States that have a plurality not a majority but a plurality of people that are that are latter day saints which is all of Utah and uh, some of southeastern Idaho and a few scattered counties in, I mean, one or two places in Colorado and Arizona and Nevada. And, you know, there's a county or two in, in a lot of western states, uh, one county in California, northern California, for example. So if you look at those plurality Mormon counties by counties uh, compared to counties that have above average, meaning above 2%, but not a plurality versus those where it's below average, below, you know, very small group, we don't find any differences except on um, that uh, social insularity measure, right? Which, that kind of makes sense, right? If, if you live in the midst of a bunch of other Mormons, a lot more of your friends and family are going to be uh, Latter-day Saints. And so that, that's the one difference that we find. We don't find anything really significant in terms of political behavior or attitudes on anything that we measure. Now, maybe that's because we didn't measure the right stuff. Uh, we, you know, we look at Utah and not Utah as well, and we don't see any difference there. Um, but, but it's really striking. It was kind of surprising because like everyone else, I think we kind of expected going in that we would see some differences and they just don't come up. What, um, what that underscores this fact that uh, the differences between Utah Mormons and Mission Field Mormons is, um, I think, an illustration of what we mean by the sacred tabernacle. So Quinn was talking about this idea that Mormons form a community, and within that community they replicate all of the aspects of Mormonism wherever they happen to be. And it would appear that all that happens within the sacred tabernacle is essentially the same, whether it's in Birmingham, Alabama, or here in, in Orem, Utah. Uh, however, as Quinn noted, that distinction on the social networks that Mormons form, that is an important difference. So we don't want to say there's no difference across Utah and non-Utah Mormons, but it's more subtle than, than it might appear. Okay, another possible um, surprise for me and maybe for other people too, is in the what you've alluded to, the growing Republican uh, nature of the party that in itself is perhaps not surprising for anybody who reads the news, but compared to what we know generationally about millennials, for example, who are heavily Democratic, and yet for Mormons, it's, it's actually the opposite. They're even more Republican than their parents. Could you talk about that some? Right, so I'm, I'm sure that no one in this room is shocked to hear that Mormons are predominantly Republican. I can imagine that as a headline. Political scientists declare Mormons are per predominantly I, I have uh, seen that headline you, before, but... Oh, right, well, you heard it here In a local first. paper, perhaps. Um, and it's also presumably not a shock to say that um, in the country writ large, millennials are much more likely to be Democrats and even to be on the left wing of the Democratic Party than are their parents and grandparents, right? That's the Bernie Sanders constituency. But what we find among Mormons is actually a very, very different pattern, and it tells us something about the fact that there was once a time when there was far more partisan equilibrium within Mormonism. Because um, today's millennials within Mormonism are predominantly Republican. But if you look at their parents' generation and maybe even their grandparents' generation, you're actually more likely to see those older Mormons be Democrats. It's not like they're overwhelmingly Democrats, but they're more likely to be Democrats than are their kids. And why is that? Well, it's because there was once a time when the idea of being a Mormon Democrat maybe wasn't quite as strange as it might appear now, um, that there were... Um, uh, um, even among the general authorities, it was widely known that there were both Democrats and Republicans, whether it was Hugh B. Brown speaking at the Democratic Convention, and uh, you can think of other, a few other um, Mormon authorities who were, who were 
it come out of the closet of their Mormon of their uh, democratic leanings. Um, and if you just sort of look at where the Mormon rank and file were, many of them were voting Democratic and were identifying Democratic. But then we begin to see that shift that Quinn described as Mormons moved from kind of a bipartisan era into an increasingly Republican era. And that's where we are now. And as young Mormons come of age, politically, that's the world they know. It kind of blows a millennial Mormon's mind to say there was once a time when, yeah, yeah, lots of Mormons were Democrats and Mormon general authorities were Democrats. I'll, I'll just add that that shift is one that occurred quite gradually. Uh, and so, it, and it's different uh, for Mormons and, and, and for Utah Mormons where we have the most data to sort of look at this in particular uh, than it is for uh, Southern Democrats that where you see as a result of uh, civil rights reforms and, and Lyndon Johnson sort of changing the, the direction of the Democratic Party uh, the, the, the National Party sort of switched sides in the 60s on the issue of civil rights, and that leads to some pretty dramatic movement in terms of uh, where Southern conservatives begin to vote and then even identify in terms of their partisanship. That doesn't happen among Mormons in the same way at all. It, it, uh, the, the changeover toward Republican uh, begins in the post-World War II era with, uh, you know, a lot of the anti-communist rhetoric of, of, of church leaders resonating toward the Republican Party. Uh, I think civil rights and, and those things do contribute some, but it's not sort of the overwhelming influence. And then it continues to just gradually shift upwards into the 70s and 80s with issues like abortion and then gay marriage. And so it moves from anti-communism to, uh, to race and civil rights, and then especially to social issues where you see the most uh, uh, change, and it continues to the present. Uh, I'm, I'm eager to collect more data at some point and see, is this ever going to level off and, and even reverse? And what it would take uh, to sort of anticipate a question is, uh, I think a, a, a marked shift in the emphasis that uh, church leaders give to particular issues. So they, they've been very uh, consistent in giving a, a dominant uh, attention to issues that, that speak to moral conservatism, uh, while at the same time, and by you know, the, the own statements at the church's newsroom website and other places, uh, encouraging political participation, saying that there are parts from both parties that are consistent with the church and the church's teachings, and, and I would point to things like immigration and things about refugees and, and so on, and, and the way the church talks about poverty as being a, a way that would point more members toward the Democratic Party. The problem is that those types of statements and issues aren't talked about nearly as much, that on balance, the, the, the church leadership still talks predominantly about those, those moral issues, and that, that's what that's what uh, gets the most attention. Let me use this as an opportunity uh, to note something that Jana is probably too modest to point out, and that is that um, Jana and Randall Balmer, who is right here in the audience, um, they have recently co-edited a book uh, with a suspiciously similar title to ours. Uh, theirs is called Mormonism and American Politics, whereas the subtitle to ours is Mormons and American Politics. But um, as suggested by the title, it gets into many of these themes. What is perhaps distinctive about um, their book is, as historians, they have, I think, brought a real depth to thinking through some of these historical patterns that we're only able to touch on in our book. Um, so there's, a, for example, a wonderful chapter by uh, Jan Ships, a name probably known to, I hope, at least some in the room, on um, Mormonism's rightward turn in the Ezra Taft Benson years, for example, um, and a number of other uh, ch chapters that really explore interesting aspects of how Mormonism interacts with American politics, both in the present, but how it has also done so in the past. So um, I would encourage you to uh, look up uh, their book again, which is published by Columbia University Press, so Mormonism and American Politics. Also on sale, I believe, outside. Thank you for the shout out. Um, it was very nice. 
So I have one more question as moderator, and then I'm going to open it up to all of you. But I have a feeling this is a question that other people are interested in as well, given the times. Donald Trump, tell us about Mormons and how they feel about Donald Trump. This seems to be one way in which Mormons have proved themselves somewhat distinctive from others in the Republican Party. Oh, there will be so many articles written on why Trump never caught on in Utah, because from a distance, it may look as though this is a state where you, if you didn't really know anything about the subculture here, that Trump might have been fairly popular. But of course, um, he wasn't and isn't. And why is that? Well, I, I would say, and Quinn and I actually have not compared notes on this, so he may have a different perspective. We'll see. Um, I would say that there's a perfect storm of factors. There's not a single cause. Um, I do think that Trump's um, anti- Muslim rhetoric has hurt him among Mormons, who I think are very sensitive to um, being a religious minority and the fact that the LDS Church back in December issued a statement that was, let's face it, a thinly veiled at best swipe at some of Trump's rhetoric. That certainly didn't help him. Um, but you know, there's another factor that's important to keep in mind that Trump's base, while you may have read in the papers, is among evangelicals in America. That's not quite right. Trump's base is among people who might nominally affiliate with evangelicalism, but are in no way connected to a religious community. So his strongest supporters are the white working class who are socially disconnected, including from their religious institutions. And what do you find in Mormon? What do you find in Utah? Well, it's a totally different picture here. Here you find people who have a broad range of social connections. Um, as I noted, they're largely among other Mormons, but that feeds a sense of civic vitality that maybe you don't find in other pockets of the country where Trump is finding um, greater support. So um, I would certainly put those two issues on the table, his anti-Muslim rhetoric and um, the fact that Mormons themselves are typically civically active and civically engaged in a way that Trump's base typically is not. I'll uh, just add to that because I agree with all of it uh, and say that if you look at Utah data in particular, the, the kind of, of uh, thing that David described in terms of, of uh, Utah Mormons uh, is even more true among Utah Republicans, right, who are, who are overwhelmingly Latter-day Saints and especially among caucus-attending Utah Republicans. Now, that's a group that's very heavily... Mormon, uh, upwards of 85 to 90 percent Mormon, right? Uh, and so, and, and, uh, and a heavy percentage of those are very, uh, self-identify as very active Mormons. If you look at data of Utah caucus attenders, they're very uh, tightly, uh, uh, very, uh, very closely tied to, the, to, the, to their activity in the church. And so everything that he said redounds even more with that caucus attending group of, of Utah Republicans. Uh, and, and, and then I would add that the only other thing I would say is that it's, it's uh, also true that that group, uh, a large proportion, probably a plurality, uh, maybe even a majority, truly does have an affinity for Ted Cruz, but I don't think that uh, that affinity is, is really at 69 or 70 percent, whatever his vote ended up as. Uh, and that's because there was a fair amount of strategic voting going on, and I have really good evidence of that. Uh, so I actually have a, a survey in the field of Utah caucus goers that shows that um, there is a group, a pretty sizable group, that liked John Kasich more than Ted Cruz on, on a terms of their favorability, but voted for Tez, Ted Cruz instead. So, they, so that's a classic case of strategic behavior, voting for your second choice. And why would they do that? because they disliked Donald Trump that much and, and, and understood in a very sophisticated way that it was important for Ted Cruz to get over 50% of the vote to deny Donald Trump any delegates at all. And, they, and, and a lot of them went that way. I think Ted Cruz would have, been, would have won Utah Republicans uh, and Utah Mormons in particular, uh, but not by the overwhelming numbers he did if we had had different circumstances, different rules, and, and not the stakes for the delegate allocation that were, that were at play. And you'll note that we did, both of us uh, neglected to say, uh, I think deliberately, that 
Utah Republicans didn't vote for Trump because Mitt Romney told them not to vote for Trump. I think that when Romney made his statement, he was reacting to exactly the same forces that probably would have naturally yeah. led to— They were already uh, there. Yeah, they were already there. He was leading, I think, more—or following more than he was leading. Thank you. Well, let's all thank Professor Monson and Professor Campbell for this discussion. Thank you.